Good morning, this is Corinne. Um, I will be teaching the Intro to GIS class. Um, I'll wait just a few minutes just to see if we'll get any more live viewers. Um, we have the chat disabled from the YouTube. We will be using the talk.io. Um, I'm sorry, tlk.io slash remote. You can find that hyperlink in both the YouTube description as well as the Eventbrite page that you use to sign up for the class. So if you just want to hop on over there, um, I will be checking the Talk.io frequently um, to see if there's any questions or comments. And if you sign on, you should see my first post just saying, welcome to the Intro to GIS class. So we'll just wait just maybe two or three more minutes to see if we have any live, any additional live viewers. Good morning, everyone. My name is Corinne Smith, and I am today's teacher. I will be doing this basic intro to GIS class. This is for viewers who have little to no experience of um, GIS, and if you don't know what GIS stands for, then this class is for you. Um, I'll just do a little bit about me. Um, I am actually one of the Pilot Remote organizers. My Twitter handle is at Ola Corinne. I have been working with GIS since 2012. I received my Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Spatial Analysis from the University of North Georgia. And then I moved across the states all the way to Flagstaff, Arizona to pursue my Master's of Science in Applied Geospatial Sciences with an emphasis in planning and recreation. I currently am a GIS IT administrator for the city of Flagstaff Water Services, where I do a lot with geospatial technologies and I've lately incorporated Python into my job. I was actually originally a computer science major when I first started university. I always loved computers and I knew that the computer science field would um, give me great opportunities to um, work with technology and I mean the pay is also pretty good and being a woman in computer science I was like the only female um, identifying person in pretty much all my classes after I received my associates in computer science I took an intro to GIS class um, it was a four summer week course over the summer so it was very accelerated and I actually just fell in love with um, the geospatial technologies. I was able to work on the computer, but I really enjoyed that I could apply um, real world problems and find real world solutions. Um, I also enjoy that I can be inside on the computer, but I also have the opportunity to go outside and do um, data verification, collection, um, everything like that. So it's the best of both worlds that I really enjoy. 
So I won't talk too long about myself. Uh, we can jump right in to the presentation. So I will mostly be doing slides and then I'll be doing a few demos. Um, as I said, the prerequisites for this class are actually none. So um, I'll show you some of the software, but there's nothing for you guys to actually follow along. This is more of a, a talk and kind of dives you into the basics of geospatial technologies, even some geography and map basics 101. So I'll give you a brief overview. We are gonna talk about geospatial technologies. We'll dive deeper into GIS. We'll talk about um, some of the basics terminologies that if you work with GIS or spatial data that you should be familiar with. I'll show you some examples, both some Python scripts, and then some web projects that were used with uh, GeoJingo and also with Flask. And then I'll leave you guys with some resources. So the purpose of this class is, like I said, it's this basic course. I want this to be the foundation so that we can start having more accelerated or intermediate advanced GIS classes where we could dive into GeoJingo or GeoPandas um, or GDAL. So this is just the basic foundation that I would like for viewers to um, reference so that they can jump right into the intermediate so they don't have to tell you what GIS is. So. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. So you should be seeing my screen. And then once again, um, we are using the um, talk IO for chat. And I have that on one of my monitors. And so I can see it. If you have any questions or um, comments, I can address them. Um, I see that we have Ooh, I'm really bad at pronouncing names, but for the individual who said hello after me, hello back. So again, this is the Intro GIS class, um, one of our classes here that Pilot is remote. Um, we're actually offering six classes this year. Um, we're just um, both Anna and I have um, big girl jobs, and we thought that doing it six times a year instead of 12 times are both easier on us and as well as our lovely volunteer teachers. So again, the quick overview of what we'll be discussing today. We're going to talk about geography, right? This is something that students should be learning in school, but if you're from the States, you probably know that geography is not taught. Um, we'll talk about geospatial technologies, which will then lead us to both the basics of GIS and why do we need GIS. And then again, some examples with Python scripts and web projects, and then I'll leave you guys with some resources. And then hopefully, maybe later this year, we'll um, dive deeper into more advanced projects and applications with geospatial technologies. So first, let's talk about geography, right? So this is just the Oxford Dictionary definition of geography, um, right? It's this physical features on Earth, it's the atmosphere, it's also that human activity that, that um, affects and also is affected by the distribution of populations, resources, you know, it, it can even be political and economical, right? So in this definition, we see physical, and then we also see human geography, right? And I was actually an instructor at the Northern Arizona University after I received my master's. I taught this freshman level intro to mapping the world, which was an elective for most individuals. Um, and you know, I, I asked them what geography is and pretty much most of them say, you know, it's, it's memorizing state capitals or country capitals, or it's knowing how many bushels of corn Iowa produces. And, that's not really what geography is. Geography is way more than just capitals and the bushels of corn. Um, as I said, it's physical geography, it's human geography, but it's also technical geography. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So we have our physical, we have our lakes, we have our mountains, we have human geography, which is distribution of populations. It's where our food deserts occur. It's those political boundary lines where we get our congressmen and women. And then we have this technical geography where we 
use these geospatial technologies to pretty much map the world around us. We can map pretty much anything that we have a spatial data for. So going back, right, we have technical geography. And technical geography is pretty much these geospatial technologies. And the geospatial technologies are comprised of these four elements. So we have GIS, which is what we're going to be talking about today. We have remote sensing. We have GPS. And we have information technology. So GIS um, stands for geographic information something, right? Um, some people say it's geographic information systems. Some say geographic information sciences. Some say that the S also can stand for studies or services. Um, my personal definition, I like to use the first one because I'm more of the technical side. I um, do a lot with the analysis and the management of data. But if you were a biologist, you might say that you would use the sciences or if you're more of a, um, you study sociology, you might say that it's studies, right? Because you want to see where certain um, ethnicities may live in a county and see, you know, why do these groups of people live here? Um, what are, are, who, what surrounds these populations too? And then some say it's services. So um, we make maps for people like, those who may work in community development, right? They need maps of the urban paths or the roadways or the neighborhoods. So to dive even deeper, so this GIS is pretty much a system that allows users to create, store, edit, analyze, and present spatial data. And so the GIS is the software that um, is used to be able to view, edit, um, anything with some kind of geographic spatial data. And some of the most popular softwares that are used out there um, is our Esri's ArcGIS suite. Um, this is mostly the leading GIS software in the states um, because a lot of the public sector, a lot of the governments use Esri. Um, they have the 24 seven customer support and that's what the government's like. If you're more of the free open source, and I know that a lot of people in Europe, they like to use QGIS, also known as Quantum GIS. It's free to download. You could download it right now. It's pretty much exactly the same as Esri. The buttons just look different. They're in different places. There's a couple different tweaks that you, um, if you use both softwares. Um, and then there's also Grass, which I personally have never used, but that is another option out there that you could also download. So next we'll just briefly talk about remote sensing. So remote sensing uses satellites or aircrafts to gather information about Earth. So this is all that satellite imagery that you see on your um, Apple Maps or Google Maps. It's more of that airborne imagery. So those are the aircrafts that fly and they capture um, aerial imagery. It's a higher resolution. They can fly those more frequently. We have those UAVs or those drones that you see. If they capture, if they have a camera and they're going up and they're capturing imagery, that is remote sensing. And then there's also LIDAR, which is light detection and range. That um, is a laser beam that goes down and it pretty much gives us those terrain models. It gives us that uh, Z, it's that elevation that you can do even further um, analysis on. So the whole point of remote sensing is that we can use imagery, both satellite or airborne or LIDAR, and we can analyze the earth without physically having to be there. And so you can dive even deeper, you know, you can get those thermal or near infrared bands and you can do um, more advanced analyses like looking at land use or land change over time. So if you have two, um, if you have imagery from like 1990 to 2010, you can see how maybe urban sprawl has affected your neighborhood or your um, county. We can also look at invasive species by looking at the um, near infrared. We can locate trails or dirt roads. Um, and we can also analyze drought over time. So next we have GPS or GNSS. 
you probably use this daily if you have a smartphone and you're trying to get from A to B, you wanna see the fastest, most efficient route. Um, the GPS is the global position system, um, but a lot of people should be just saying the global navigation satellite system. So GPS is the um, US government system, um, satellite system. It was available to civilians in May two, of 2000. And so we have satellites that are up in space and we can find your specific location on Earth you need to be connected to at least three satellites to get that triangulation to find your exact location. But obviously, the more satellites, the more accurate your, your position is going to be. And then there's also GLONASS, which is Russia's GPS system. And then there's Galileo, which is the EU's. If you have a more advanced GPS, one of those higher grade, where you need to find um, or you need to collect gas line information, you'll probably have like a $7,000 GPS um, unit and it actually can connect to the Galileo system, GPS, and also China's system, which I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. So that's the right, a GPS or a GNSS, that's where you find your location on Earth. And then last, we have information technology. Right, if you're watching this webcast, um, you probably are interested in the IT field. Um, but the whole geospatial technology is moving forward, right? We're not, get, we're not stuck, we're not using the Garmin units, um, and we're not using paper maps as much. We're moving towards these interactive web maps. We're moving towards these mobile applications on our smartphones. And so um, we have ArcGIS Online, which is an online platform that a lot of the governments use to view their spatial data or maps. We have Google Maps or Apple Maps. Um, and then these two are um, examples from the federal government. I checked earlier today and Craftlands isn't working. It might be because of the shutdown. Um, I'm not sure if you guys want to give it a look. And then there's also this Global Surface Water Explorer, um, if you're interested in water. Those are uh, two interactive web maps that have the geospatial technologies and then it has that web map incorporated. So as we can see, geospatial technologies are comprised of those four units. We have the GIS, so we have remote sensing, we have GNSS and we have information technology. And today we're talking about GIS, which is where we can create, analyze, edit, and present geographic or spatial data. So we use geospatial technologies every day, right? If you have a smartphone, you most likely use geospatial technologies, whether it be Google Maps or Apple Maps, or if you're getting an Uber or Lyft, um, if you use kind of some kind of bike share, um, like Spin Bikes, Spin was this uh, company that was here in Flagstaff, Arizona for a trial period, and you can download their app and you can see where the closest bike was. And so this is a dockless bike share program. It uses GPS, there's a GPS receiver on the bikes and you can download the app to see where the closest bike is where you can rent. Um, public transit apps to see when your next bus or tram is going to arrive. Hiking trails, geocaching, um, you know, we get that recreation, we get that um, urban planning, but pretty much you probably use geospatial technologies every day and you might not realize it. So it all goes into that smartphones, right? Um, you can download PDF maps, you can, if you like to travel like I do, you can save sections of Google Maps um, on your smartphone and you can turn your data off or put it in airplane mode and you can get driving directions or um, find hiking trails or roads for that specific area that you downloaded. And you can also have the ability to download uh, data or sorry, you can also collect data using um, the apps on your phone from like the Google Play Store or the Apple Store, like the Arc Collector or Google Maps or other crowdsource apps um, that you may use. 
Um, the big thing about using your smartphone to collect data eliminates the need for the Gorman GPS. And so your phone, even if you have the data in airplane mode turned off, your GPS still works. It still communicates to the satellites and you can see your exact location. Um, but you can use your smartphone to easily view data on maps. Um, it's not going to be as maybe accurate. It might have 10 to, feet, 10 to 15 feet off, but still a general area is better than maybe no you know, area at all. And when I was an instructor for that freshman level class, I had them both use the Garmin units as well as a GPS device. And, you know, this age of students, they told me that they enjoyed using their smartphone better. I don't know if it's one less device to learn or if they found that using their, you know, the, the keyless keypad instead of using the joystick to type in names or attributes, additional data tied to that point. They just said they like their smartphone better. And then, um, you know, it's great for crowdsourcing because not everyone has a GPS, but the odds of everyone having a smartphone are, is way, you know, higher. Excuse me one second, taking a sip of my coffee. Yeah, um, so I'm looking over at the chat and Lindsay says that the OpenStreetMap um, app is great for offline navigation. Um, I don't use OpenStreetMaps as much as I should. I definitely should um, because you can also contribute your hiking trails or your bike trails to the community. It's free to download. I know it's heavily used over in Europe. Um, I just need to use it more. <laughs> so right, um, geospatial technologies are all around us, which means that geography means even more in today's digital world. So who can use geospatial technologies? Um, pretty much everyone, right? Everyone from historians to planners, photographers, even those who are into literature um, who want to give their readers like this, a map of their, you know, community or a little world that they've created, even tour guides. So yeah, Lindsay says that joining from Sweden, Sweden yeah, the open street map is, is really popular there than in the US and I agree. All right. So what do all these elements have in common? It's maps, right? So everything from GIS, remote sensing, with the GPS, GNSS, to IT, kind of that funneling ground ends up being maps. Um, so I'll briefly go over some map terms. Um, if you're not from the States, this is probably a recap for you, but if you're from the States, this might be new, um, just because geography is not, not really taught in that K through 12 system. So briefly, really fast, just latitude, longitude, prime meridian, equator, and hemisphere, right? So our latitudes, they run north to south. This is also that y-axis if you look at that Cartesian grid. So these are also known as parallels because they run parallel from the equator. Um, we have our lines of longitude. So these are also known as the meridians. They run at right angles and they meet at the north and south poles. This is our x-axis and they measure east and west. And then that prime meridian, you know, runs through Greenwich, England. It's considered at zero degrees of longitude, while the equator is at zero degrees latitude. It's at it's that half circle that um, runs right there. And then we also have scale. So this is the relationship of the distance on the map to the actual distance on the ground. And so there's three different ways that you could express scale. So it can be that ratio that's common, such as that one to 50,000. You can have something verbally, such as one inch equals 50,000 miles. And then we have this scale bar at the bottom, which is commonly seen on maps. And so the whole thing with scale is that it's unitless, right? So I can say one inch equals 
50,000 inches on the ground or one centimeter equals 50,000 centimeters on the ground or one coffee cup on this map equals 50,000 coffee cups on the real earth. So scale is unitless. So I'll talk about coordinate systems, which is a little more advanced. Um, this is actually like a chapter three. If you take a um, GIS class in university, so the big thing with coordinate systems is that there's there's two types. There's unprojected. These are our geographic coordinate systems. This is when we talk about the Earth as a 3D object, as in a globe. We use degrees of latitude and longitude to describe our location. And then we also have projected coordinate systems. This is when we take that three-dimensional Earth we cut it somehow and make it flat to make a two-dimensional Earth. And we have to do some kind of math to get that latitude and longitude into a projected coordinate system where we can then describe our location in two dimensions. So this is a standard um, seven and a half quad map from the United States Geological Survey. USGS. They're extremely common. Um, they've been used since the 1800s. But as you can see here, there's um, three coordinate systems on this one map. And so this little blue star, that's the one point on the map. Um, so you can see in the very top, we have that latitude and longitude because it has that degree. And then we have those minutes and seconds. In the middle here, we have UTM. Universe transverse, Universal Transverse Mercator. It's a projected coordinate system. It's used across the whole world. And so that actually measures in meters. And then at the bottom, we have a state plane, which is another projected coordinate system. And that's for that specific, specific, ah, specific <laughs> state plane, wherever state this is from. Um, so we have a geographic coordinate system, and then we have two projected coordinate systems, both UTM and an estate plane. So once again, this is showing a point in a GIS. This is actually in Esri's arc map. So we have that same point, but again, it's, it's um, in three different coordinate systems. There is no right or wrong. It just depends who your audience is or if you need to do measurements or not. We have this in meters, which is probably an ETM. We see the latitude and longitude. And then we see it ending in feet, which probably tells us that it's in a state plane. Because those in the states, we like to measure in feet for some weird me for some weird, you know, reason. Meters makes more sense, but. So let's dive into this geographic coordinate system. Um, so it uses those degrees, um, minutes and seconds. This is when we talk about our globe in three dimensions. And so when we use GPS or the GNSS, we're talking about the globe in three dimensions because we're um, physically standing outside, we're communicating with the satellites, and we're finding our exact location. We're not doing any kind of projection. We're not making this into a, we're not talking about two dimensions, we're in three dimensions. So they're in this geographic coordinate system. And um, to keep it simple, it's just the degrees from the equator and the degrees away from the prime meridian. That's how the degrees are um, measured. And da -da. The degrees you can see in three different um, ways. You can see it in degrees, minutes, seconds. So we have the degrees, we have the 26 minutes and the 46 seconds. We can also see it as decimal, or sorry, degrees, decimal minutes. And so it's the same exact coordinate system. It's just, it takes away that seconds and um, does the math to put the minutes into 58 point something. This is probably the most popular um, used if you use a GPS. And then there's also decimal degrees, um, 
which I guess I got caught off, but it pretty much would be like 40 dot and then it'll take this 26 um, point something and do even additional math. So it's just a, a four zero dot and then the rest would be that conversion of the minutes and seconds, likewise for the longitude. So uh, my apologies for that not showing up. I'll fix that when I publish the sl slides. So the thing about degrees um, is that it's a little tricky to tell someone when you tell someone your degrees, right? Um, because one degree at the equator is about 110 kilometers, and about 60 minutes is one degree, but 60 seconds is one minute. Um, so we don't actually use degrees um, to like measure time to get to a location. Um, it does measure distance. But you don't want to use a geographic coordinate system to measure area or if you're trying to tell someone a distance. Um, because it's difficult because the lines of longitude converge at the poles. So you can see when you look at that North Pole, how all those lines kind of go to the one place. That's because those lines of longitude converge at the poles. And so you can see at the closer to the poles, um, the longitude is very small. It's about almost half than it is at one degree longitude at the equator. So because the lines of longitude converge at the poles, that it's a little different, difficult to measure in degrees. So to measure distance or area, we have to take that round three-dimensional Earth and project it into two dimensions. And when we work with a GIS, we could measure in the latitude and longitude or in that geographic coordinate system. But if you do any kind of, if you want to measure area, um, it's just a couple clicks of a button where you can project that coordinate system into a two-dimensional coordinate system to do the analysis. If you have some free time, you can watch this quick video. It's about six minutes and it talks about the coordinate systems a little more in depth. So, um, datums to our Earth isn't perfectly round, right? It's a geoid, and so it depends of where is the center. And we use this to be able to get those coordinate systems. Okay, the geoid is that three D shape of Earth, um, and so we use the different datums for our projection coordinate systems. Um, most of us will probably use this NAD83 if we use some kind of coordinate or a state plane coordinate system. And then this WGS84 is pretty much worldwide. So when we, did, when we put that three-dimensional Earth into a flat coordinate system, we look at um, quite a few different things, such as distance, direction, scale, area, and shape. And you want to pick the best coordinate system to what you're trying to analyze or what you're trying to show. So there's three most type, three most common types of projections. We have our cylindrical, conic, and azimuthal. And as you can see, when you look at um, North America here, how it looks different in those three projected coordinate systems. So cylindrical projection is, the most common one is Mercator. If you had that colorful math in your elementary school classroom, um, that's what it was. It was, a, it was a Mercator map. And so when we take a piece of paper and we put it around a sphere, the piece of paper touches the sphere at the center of um, the sphere. So like right where the equator is. And so the cylindrical projections are best used if you're dealing with the equator area because that's where there is less distortion. So as you move either further north or further south, um, that's where we're gonna get that um, distortion. Conical projections are used for us in those mid latitudes, such as um, in the States, um, because when we put a cone over a globe, the piece of paper will touch around those mid latitudes. And so we use Lambert conformal conic or Albert's equal area um, when we're in the States to um, get rid of that distortion that Mercator uses or has. 
And then there's this azimuth hole where you just put that piece of paper flat on that circle and wherever that tangent line is, that's where it's most accurate. So we use these for um, mostly the poles. And so there's more if you can do this globe. Um, and then there's like this cute little heart shaped globe, the pseudo conic. So there's lots of projections out there. Um, some project, some of them have the conformity. Um, so like we have Lambert conformal conic, we have equal area, um, equidistance. So like here we have Mercator and then we have the equidistant conic projection and you can see how the T projections look different. Um, Mercator distorts distance and area but preserves direction and shape. Whereas the equidistant conic distorts direction and shape but preserves distance. So there's trade-offs to both projections. Again, it's what area are you mapping and what are you trying to do? Are you trying to say how large of an area, sorry, um, area, or are you trying to have some kind of direction or shape? So there's trade-offs. And then the comprised projection is the Robinson, which distorts a little bit of all four properties. And because it distorts a little bit of everything, it kind of makes it the most um, useful projection because the most accurate, I guess, to get that three-dimensional in that 2D plane. Um, so here we take Mercator, Lambert from Oconic, and then just latitude and longitude, a geographic coordinate system. Our anchor point is here in Kansas, that pink dot. And you can see how all three um, United States, the lower 48, how they're similar, but also kind of really different in boundary lines. So again, it just depends what you're trying to do. So yeah, we have a universal transverse Mercator um, as one of our projected coordinate systems. It divides um, zones across the world into these ETM zones and everything's measured in meters. This is a global system. So this is what the grid looks like here. So in Arizona, we tend to use ETM 11 North. Whereas if you're over here in like Germany, you may use, what is that? 31 North. So this is what UTM looks like. It has the zone out front, so we have 12 South. And then it does the Easting, which is our X. And then it does the Northing, which is our Y. So this is actually longitude and then latitude. And that's because well, if we go back to our um, math, right, we have our X, Y. And so pretty much mapping the coordinate systems, it uses that X, Y data. State plane, which is a local system if you're in the States, it uses feet, very much like UTM, only it has state specific, specific zones. Oh, I cannot say that word today. So if you look at Texas, Texas has five zones for their state plane. Um, Arizona, we have three. So there's different types of maps out there, right? So as we're diving into GIS, we have um, all, different uh, all different sorts of maps. We have physical maps, distribution maps, political maps, movement maps. So here we're looking at elevation, right? I live in Arizona. Um, I actually live here in Flagstaff, which actually is home to the highest point in the state. So the reddish, more red the color, the higher the point when you dive into this blue is when you're a little bit closer to sea level. So this is a distribution map. Um, this is the old map of Australia where apparently there's no sheep or there's some sheep. And we can also see where wheat lays. So we have, here's a political map of China. So we can see the different um, areas. This is just your normal navigation map. Here's most of the major highways in the United States. Topographical map, here we're looking at elevation. So the closer those contour lines are, the more that there's an elevation change. Resource map, 
which is pretty stretched out, but it tells you there the different land cover classes are. So the different colors mean that it's a forest patch or it's ag land or other. Place map, which is what you might use when you use Google Earth, right? Where is that restaurant that you're meeting your friend at? And then you might look at a weather map if you watch the news. So where what the weather may look like for that day or in the near future. So what all these maps have in common is that we display some kind of spatial data on maps. But these aren't your Mercator maps, right? Um, which is what Mercator's map looks like back in 1538, really nice and pretty. Um, and it's not quite those road atlases, right? But here is an example of how we can use GIS to look at land cover change, right? So this is a census track in Hall County, Georgia, and you can see where they took away some greenery, some, some forest, and they actually developed um, either, high de how, uh, either developed housing or more streets or shopping malls. So you can see that in the middle, we have green, but over here we have that red. So even towards the bottom, uh, how that green just disappeared in five years and became built up. And so this is how we can use GIS um, to create these types of maps. Or we can take a GPS and go out into the field and we can collect data such as trails, roads, fences, trash piles, and we can bring that back into GIS and we can create these maps, which we could look at or we can give to a supervisor so they know where issues um, may occur and how or where they can go and send volunteer groups for trash cleanups. This is remote sensing being used, <clears throat> but we can create maps once again to show um, the public who may not have any experience with remote sensing or GIS, and we can show them where roads or trails are so they can go up there and recreate as they wish. Um, once again, here's another uh, trail map that someone or like a jogger, a hiker, a photographer may use for their Saturday activities. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, then Maps are worth probably a million words. So maps of just that where, so where is your business situated? Where are your clients? Like pretty much the question is where is the problem and where or how can we make solutions to you know, alleviate that problem? And so we address spatial data with, or sorry, we, we address the where with this spatial or geographic data. And so let's we'll dive into GIS. Um, now that we have that fundamentals of geospatial technologies and geography in those simple map terms, um, we can dive deeper now into GIS. I'm going to take another sip of my coffee. And then once again, don't forget about the chat. If you have any questions or comments, um, feel free to use that. I have that on one of my monitors. So, right, this GIS is that geographic information system which we use to view, edit, create, analyze, manage um, all things spatial data. So, a spa spatial data has to have some kind of geometry. It has to have that location in space. And that location in space contains that X, Y, right? This is what we just talked about. It has to have some kind of um, place on Earth that we can show. And then once we have that, we can then do further analysis, we can edit, we can uh, manage, but it needs to have an X, Y. As I said, this X, Y can be latitude, longitude. It could be that UTM. It could be that state plane. It could be that military grid, but it has to have an X, Y. And then just going back, so there are tools. So if you have, you go out to the field with your phone or GPS, 
and it comes back into that degrees minutes. You can um, project that to get to measure distance or area using GIS. So you don't have to manually do all the math on a piece of paper. You can um, use these tools, which actually have Pi, ArcPi scripts um, with them if you wanted to really understand how the tools work. They're there. But we don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you just need to project, just click the button and it'll project for you. So when we're dealing with GIS data, um, if I say GIS data, I mean spatial data, geographic data, right? It's some kind of data that has that X, Y geometry, that where. So they come in two main flavors. We have our vector and we have our raster. So vector data are these points, lines, and polygons that you may see on a map, right? This is all vector. So on this example, our points are wells. Our lines um, right here is actually a river. And then the polygon is here at this nice little lake. And look, we have a little scale bar, two kilometers. Um, with vec dealing with vector data, it's extremely easy to stack layers in GIS. You can throw layers together, um, and then you can create meaningful maps or do analysis. With vector data, you can also look at attributes to see um, what it describes, like does it have a name or maybe a how much, what type, when it was installed or when it was added to the GIS. So vector data is extremely useful. We can do lots of geoprocessing analyses. Um, we can create maps with all the stacking. We can look at the different attributes. Um, to get vector data, it's very, very common that it's in the form of a zipped or compressed shape file. So in this zipped folder, you'll probably see, like, I think the minimum is three, the maximum I've seen is seven or eight. So it's all these different fields, this .shp.shx. These all have special something tied with that geographic data. So you need it all and able to put it into a GIS. You can't just send the .shp. You need to actually zip it all together and then you can email it to a friend. But you need everything to have that into a GIS. So where can I find shapefiles? You can download them at numerous places. So we have the National Historical GIS. If you are interested in boundary files or historical data, there's DIVA, GIS. You can look at National Land Cover Database um, if you want to look at change over time. Tiger has a lot of our roads if you're in the states. But a big thing is that you can look at your local government or state government if you want to look at your, um, your local area. And so they probably have lots of data that should be open for you um, where you can download it from their clearinghouse or um, if you email them, they should be able to give you the data as long as it's not sensitive. So then we have image, or so we have raster data. So this is our imagery, right? So the area um, is usually covered in this grid, right, with equal sizes, square cells. So these are our pixels, right? And so there's actually not a lot of attributes that can be tied to raster data. Um, it's normally a, a single value for that specific cell, like the color. But we can use this to look at change over time using the like near infrared. So the raster data, just keep in mind that this is our imagery and it's full of cells. It can't hold attributes really, and it's just those squares. So you can't get really point slides or polygons. Um, out unless you do further analysis. So here's an example of vector versus raster, right? So we have our real world. We have our houses. We have some trees. 
and we have this river that runs through. So if we look at a raster, which is our grid, we have to put what each, we have to give an attribute to the cell to try and represent it as best as we can. So our river is really has this low resolution that runs through here, and then one cell is the house, and we have a couple of trees here. Whereas we, we have the rector res representation, we'll have point, point, we have this line, and then we have a polygon for our trees, which trees could also be points if they wanted to, and this river could be a polygon. Um, so this is what the difference between the raster and the vector if you're looking at one area. So raster data you can also um, use as a base map for your vector data. So you don't have to, you can use both at the same time. Um, it could help enhance your vector data, or if you're trying to show it to um, like a city council, they can see um, the area and see what your proposed new housing development may look like. So we can also download imagery from the USGS Earth Explorer and the USGS National Map Viewer. I'm pretty sure this is open to everyone in the world because they have global data or global imagery such as Landsat, which is a satellite that runs, that uh, nav circumnavigates the globe and it collects um, imagery for the entire world pretty much. And then the USGS National Map Viewer is pretty much the same thing as the Earth Explorer, but I think with the map viewer, you can also download um, those digital elevation models if you're look, interested in like terrain or if you want to add like that hill shade, kind of add that three dimensional look to your map. So, once you have this download, this GIS, the spatial data downloaded, you need GIS software to be able to view it. So, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, um, the Esri products are out there. They're not free. Um, all pretty much any university that teaches a GIS class, they're probably teaching Esri products. A lot of the local, state governments, federal government uses the Esri products. But if you um, just want to learn GIS on your own, um, you might find QGIS uh, valuable because it's free and it's open source. There's also grass and map info, but I'd say Esri products in the States is probably the big um, driver. Then QGIS um, is that runner up, mostly because it's free. So I'll just give you guys a nice little arc map demo. So this is what arc map looks like when I open it up. There's nothing because there's nothing there. Use our table of contents. As I move around here, you should see the units changing here on the bottom right. This is where I can get that coordinate system. Currently, there's nothing loaded, and so that's why those um, units look very weird. And it says unknown units because there's nothing here. So I already have this set up with uh, my environment, all my spatial data is downloaded. Um, but I'll just throw some stuff in just to show you what GIS looks like. So, oops, wrong one. If I wanna look at fire hydrants. Just taking a minute. Um, and then don't forget that I am looking at the chat. So if you have any questions or comments that you would like to contribute, please feel free to do that. You can find the chat link in the YouTube description as well as the Eventbrite page. So um, I just got a question, is ArcGIS only for Windows or can it be installed on other OSs? So it, it's for sure on Windows. 
You can't put it on Mac, um, but I think you could put it on Linux. I'm not entirely sure. I don't use Linux. Um, but if you have a free download, a student version, um, I would give it a try. But again, the software is not free unless you're taking like a GIS class. Um, I don't think they offer any kind of free trial, but um, yeah, I know for sure you can't use GIS on Mac. Um, because um, I had some students, right, when I was teaching and um, they had to put the, they had to put a Windows or they had to like use remote desktop to connect to a school computer because it uses Windows. Why isn't it offered on Macs? Because we, you know, the student population, for example, I would say almost every other student, you know, college student in the States owns a MacBook. So like, why can't it be used on Mac? I don't know. I don't work at Esri. <laughs> But great question, thank you for utilizing that chat. So here is ArcMap, this is what it looks like. And so I just pulled over some spatial data. So here we can see fire hydrants. Um, this is within the city of Flagstaff. And so I'm gonna use this identify tool and I'm just going to identify a hydrant by um, just clicking on it. And then it pops up a window. And so here are all the attributes with this one point data, right? Because this is vector. And so we can see the entry date that it was added into the GIS. We have that hydrant number. Um, we have the install date. We have the elevation. We have the pressure zone, what type of water. Um, and then we can add, you know, like pressures. Um, so anything that we might find interesting, not necessarily us, but maybe our customers, such as our supervisors, that they need to know like when the hydrant was installed or if there's been any inspections. So we have hydrants and I'm going to show you what layer stacking looks like. So I'll take in a minute to draw, but I just added the water mains and so now you can see all the water mains that are connecting the hydrants. I'm just going to zoom in and so you can see the hydrants on the water mains. Um, and so with GIS you know you can change the symbology so I'm just going to make everything a blue line And then I'll make my hydrants. Let's do these points that are red. So there we go, we have some hydrants on some water lines. And so, let's not search. So if I go to land, in this database. And I need to remember which one it's in, so I'm planning. I'll do neighborhoods. And then I'll go here. And I'll give each neighborhood name a different color. So here we have our neighborhoods, which are these polygons, right? We have our water mains, which are these lines. And then we have these fire hydrants, which are our points. So we have, I'm showing you these points, lines, and polygons. So you can do some analysis, like if I select this neighborhood and I can do this select by location. 
And then if I do, what is it? Hydrants from neighborhoods, but I only use the selected layer. And if I do are completely within, if I hit okay, it should select all the hydrants that fall inside this neighborhood. And it does. So now you can see that the points are now this light blue. And I can go over here to hydrant, go to the attribute table. And I can see how many hydrants are selected. So 59 hydrants. So there are 59 hydrants in this Fox Glen neighborhood. So I could have manually counted all of the red dots, or I can use a simple select by location. It took me less than seven clicks and I was able to discover that there's 59 hydrants in this neighborhood. And I know that there's 59 because these are all light blue. And then um, I can do the same thing with how many, how much, mile of line, or in this case, it's probably, um, if I just change it from hydrant to pressurized main, completely within, hit OK. So now all the lines are highlighted. And if I go to the attribute table for the pressurized main, there's 289, sorry, 281 line segments. But if I go all the way over here, I have this shape length. And if I do uh, statistics, I can see that the, the sum is 35,664. I can't convert that to miles off the top of my head. That's about 6.75 miles of water main that runs through that one neighborhood. So this is our vector data. And I can show you some raster as a base map. Um, so we have raster for our city. If I do, do 2013. So it just is this base map here that we can do. And then we can change the neighborhoods to be somewhat transparent. see. So then there we go. We have this raster imagery. Oops. That's we're using as kind of a space map. And then we have our polygons, our points and our lines. So we can even zoom in a little closer if we wanted to. On this cul-de-sac. So there's a hydrant right here, and this water main runs all the way to the end of the cul-de-sac. So this is what arc map looks like. And then you can use Python within the software as well, and you can write some scripts if you want to do some analysis. Um, like I said, a lot of the tools have the Python script attached if you wanted to customize and make your own toolbox. So I just go search for tools. Um, let's talk about that project tool. So then if I just go to this project, ah, where'd it go? Uh, hit open. Did it open up on my other screen? Uh, 
I wonder, I can, hold on, it should have opened. I don't know where it went. <laughs> I'll use a different tool then. Uh, let's go here. Shouldn't be the problem. So this is just a point density tool um, that I just opened up, but you should be able to, if you go to like tool help, it like tells you what the tool, what the tool will do. So if I were to do this, it we'd find like where all the high density fire hydrants exist. But again, you probably wouldn't do this with hydrants, but maybe with like crime location data, like where all the crimes occurring, and then you can see like. Um, I must illustrate hotspots of where crime occurs, and then you can have police officers go out and um, patrol that area. And then it tells you everything that the tool do, does. But then here we get that code sample. So like this is what is really going on behind the scenes with all these tools. So it uses this ArcPy library. Um, and so you give it the, you know, your workspace and um, like this is actually what the black box is doing. And you could create your own tool by using, you know, bits and pieces or your own toolbox by using bits and pieces of um, this already pre-made tools. So you're not reinventing the wheel, but you might be combining tools to create a more efficient um, like work process, right? So that's all I wanted to show you with ArcMap. I don't see anything in the chat, so I'll just go back to my presentation. So, oops. So right, what does GIS and Python have to do with each other? Um, you pretty much behind the scenes of GIS, especially with ArcMap, they have all those tools that use Python. Um, Python is also in QGIS um, and I'm pretty positive that all those tools also have the Python script attached to it as well. So you can create your own toolbox. And then um, if you want to dive even deeper, if you are an advanced Python user, uh, you probably use some kind of web, maybe. Um, either using Django or Flask. And you can put your spatial data onto the internet as well using these applications. So I'll just show you what I've done with Python and with GIS. Um, so I'll do this one first. Again, this is nothing fancy. Um, so as I said, I'm the GIS IT administrator for water services. And so we use a work order management system. And I have, we use CityWorks. And we have um, these open work orders for our crew members. And so we have the ability to download those as shapefiles. Remember shapefile, our vector data. And then with the shapefile, you can pull that directly into GIS, in this case, ArcMap. And so I created this, this script for our worst case scenario. What if we lose internet here in the city? Um, and we need to get our guys, you know, out there into the field and do these work orders. So every week, I'm looking at these saved searches within CityWorks. And I have two network paths. I have my local computer, and then I have this share drive on our city network. And with this script, I pretty much create a new folder based on that today's date and I download the shapefile URL, and um, it gives us the shapefile. 
and can pull that up real quick real quick um my c drive city works so here we have shape file downloads right that's what that folder's name if i open it up it shows me every time the script's been ran so i have it work going every friday but it looks like it didn't go yesterday i need to look at that and then if you just open this up, it's the zip folder. Remember, it, if you are downloading a shape file, it needs to be zipped. And then inside are um, these five files, which are needed to open up that shape file. So if I just do, do open distribution, if I extract all, and then if I open up ArcMap again, I'll turn off the raster because it's so my map is blank. And then if I just pull that here. So here it's telling me that my shape file that I am pulling in is in this geographic coordinate system, but everything is in feet. I'm just gonna hit okay. I don't need to do a projection right now. Um, it may be just a couple of feet off compared, but it'll still tell us, it'll give us an idea. So, and then boom, we have all the open work orders for our guys. And then they can just hit the inspect tool and they can say that they need to do a repair um, at that hydrant. And then you're like, wait, Corinne, what hydrant? So if we pull in the hydrant, so you can see that they need to do this hydrant right here. So. That's that one Python script that I wrote. Again, nothing too complicated. And then here is something else. So I can't take all the credit for this. Um, this uses Brandon Whitney's um, bone structure from CityWorks. And so I'm pretty much um, we're using request and JSON. We're taking the um, credentials and then we're looking at the inspections and then we're um, displaying from those inspections, we are creating work orders. So I do this every day to take the inspections and create work orders. It uses Python, it uses the CityWorks API, but that's what I'm doing, running it every evening, creating work orders based off instructions, inspections. Example web maps. So, exit, oops. Close out of here for a second. So, I think I tried to go to croplands.org, but it wasn't working. Yeah, so I used to work on this project here at the USGS, but it uses the raster, right, those cells, and it's displaying all of the global croplands here um, in the world. And it's an interactive web map, so you can see, you can zoom into your neighborhood, or rather your city, and see um, where the croplands are. And so you can, if you're scrolling down here on the basic USGS site, you can see all these static um, maps that have been created by the scientists. So if you go to your city local um, government website, you might be able to find some maps. Um, here is our solid waste disposal. So we have our bulk trash pickup, you know, which neighborhoods are getting picked up when. We can look at trash. So like um, up here in Cheshire, they're getting their trash done on Mondays. You can look at recycling. So like down here, the recycling is on Mondays. 
And then if you do glass, you can see when it's gonna be picked up. So every third Wednesday, or you can go to this location here and drop off your glass. Theybury.us is a website that my, um, or my undergrad professors, Zach Miller created with a group of students. And so they mapped out um, cemeteries and they, this uses GeoJingo and I apologize, but the croplands one was using a flask. And so here we have polygons and we have that imagery and um, you should be able to see the points. So use just the maps of the symmetry. Oh, here we go, grave marker map. So here we have all the grave markers. And then if you zoom in, you can see like, oh, this is Kegels and it has the picture and it tells them um, information from that marker. And you can view the marker on the map. And then lastly, here's CityWorks. This is what we use in the city of Flagstaff and you can, um, the crew members can see where all the work orders that they need to do. So this uses, um, it uses ArcMap, ArcGIS services and into here, our CityWorks work order management platform. Let's see. And so, oops, going back one more. So where are we? So I kind of kind of dove into a little bit of all three of these, right? So kind of the simple basic for like our freshman level students, they use this ArcGIS online a lot. They use the story maps and this is all of Esri's platforms. So you can go and create a free 30 day trial on ArcGIS online. And if you have some free time, I'd say go ahead and sign up. You can play around, you can look at Living Atlas data which is data for all over the world. Um, and then in the middle here is our more intermediate and advanced data analysis. So this is when we actually download um, software onto a machine, right? Either it being ArcMap Desktop or QGIS. And we have this ba basic Python scripting. Um, I kind of showed you what tool cool toolboxes may look like, but you can dive even deeper and create your own toolbox. And then we have remote sensing software. This is also where we might use GDAL or GeoPandas. And then here, creating your own apps, um, either using Django or Flask or a mobile web app. And you can dive deeper into spatial databases and maybe even Python libraries if you're interested. But this is where we would go into GeoDjango and maybe even Flask. Um, and you can use like um, Mapbox or Leaflet.js to get that um, you know, the JS or the CSS into those web projects. So today I kind of covered both the beginner and almost intermediate um, specs for GIS and then um, I'd see future talks, including like GeoPandas, GDAL, and maybe even GeoDjango. Um, so I just want to give a special thanks to Northern Arizona, City of Flagstaff, University of North Georgia, um, and that's all I had for today. Again, it was just a basic rundown of geography, geospatial technologies, and um, GIS. And I gave you guys a look of some real life projects. I'll follow up with um, an email of all the links that I've used. But um, if you have any questions, I'm looking at the chat. I'll just wait a minute. Just throw the child on my other screen. So hopefully um, this was an educational uh, talk for you guys. 
learning about GIS, um, as I said, I see this talk being the foundation um, for GIS, and then the next step would be, you know, working with Python scripts into QGIS, um, GeoPandas. Um, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Yeah, it's a lot of information to cover, and I did this in an hour and 20 minutes. But yeah, you can take um, full courses. You know, if you take a GIS class at a university, pretty much what I covered is like a an intro course. Everything diving into on the basics of geography, the map terms, and then finally looking at um, like ArcMap GIS. So yeah. Um, I would love to reach out to other GIS um, users to see if they would like to teach another intermediate or advanced level class. Um, I don't use GeoPandas myself. I would actually love to watch that one. So I'll just wait a couple more seconds in case anyone else is typing. Oh, so Coursera has a nice specialization course on GIS. Yeah, so I'll send my slides out, um, and I'll also send out links. Um, if you are, if you attend, if you signed up for the Eventbrite um, page, I'll send out an email, and then we'll have this video, or we'll have the slides up um, on the Pilot Remote website. Um, I think we're a little behind on the website. Uh, I hope to get on there and update it really soon. So again, thanks a lot for watching and participating. I hope it was meaningful for you all. And um, have a great rest of your Saturday.